Clack. Um, so lesson nine, and I promise you to talk about time, uh, but you'll you'll have to wait a little bit of time because I got a, a certain number of questions. So I want to answer these questions um, because I realized that uh, from the questions that there were holes here and there. So I want to uh, answer. One is um, um, sort of historical. Two are very technical, and then. Uh, there's another one about uh, something missing about the interpretation which, uh, which I said. So let me list the questions so I don't, I don't forget. Uh, uh, the first uh, is the relation with Penrose uh, speed networks. Uh, what, what does Penrose speed network have to, have to do with these speed networks? And in particular, in Penrose spin network theory, there's something called the evaluation of a spin network. So what is the evaluation? It's a number. Evaluation of a spin network. That's the first question. The second question uh, was, uh, I wrote at some point this uh, metric in uh, um, the uh, uh, Hilbert space of representation J, and uh, I said, uh, somebody told me, well, you said, uh, I'm going to say later what it is and give the exact formula, which I didn't, so I'm going to give you this. Uh, that will be uh, a feeling thing. And somebody asked me the relation with the Klebsch Gordon coefficient, that one study in elementary quantum mechanics between the intertwinings and the Klebsch Gordon coefficients. And basically, they're the same thing. And uh, I want to just put the, the dot on the eyes and say what, what exactly. So, Klebsch-Gordon coefficients are the things uh, that allow you to take uh, two particles, uh, spin J1, J2, with angular momentum M1, M2, and decompose it into um, the, 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 the composite system uh, into representation J with angular momentum M, and uh, what is the relation between these and the intertwiners? These are the three main questions. And then, uh, uh, just rapidly, uh, what fixes the, 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 the number? I, I, I said that the EI, the E vector, is some number. Uh, h bar g uh, the operator so what is this number and uh, um, somebody said what what about the the other operators the diagonal operators um, f of h h l puts an l also here um, what is their exact interpretation? I, I, I sort of waved my hand uh, <clears throat> saying, well, when you go from one reference to the other, you rotate, but that was not very precise. Uh, in fact, strictly speaking, not correct. There's a missing piece. So I'll, I'll, I'll just say something rapidly, even if we'll, if we'll go back to that. So let me go through these questions rapidly. First, um, <clears throat> um, Penrose developed a, a theory which he called the uh, spin network theory. Uh, very early, I don't remember when, in the 60s or something like that. Uh, and uh, he had some, uh, some notes that circulated about that. Uh, it's a very pretty thing, mathematically, um, completely independently of everything I told you. Um, and uh, when uh, the spin loop flu quantum gravity uh, were found, uh, were not found uh, um, knowing about spin theory. In fact, uh, uh, we stumbled upon spin network, uh, uh, pen of spin networks. Uh, um, in the process of uh, diagonalizing the area and the volume, in fact, in the calculation of the eigenvalue of the volume, um, uh, we realized that, uh, in fact, it was Lee Smalling that uh, uh, at some point said, but this looks very much like pen of spin networks. I didn't know about pen of spin networks. Lee was in Verona in Italy. We were sort of try to diagonalize the volume and define this operator cleanly and, and do that. And um, uh, it, the construction of the theory went through some very many turns, so I may say something about that. 
Um, so there was not this clarity about the SU2 representation theory which we have now. In fact, we didn't even r realize that we were doing SU2 representation theory. We were basically worked only in the fundamental representation, just, and putting together loops, and not realizing that putting together loops and symmetrizing them was essentially going to higher representations. Um, so we have all this calculus, and it looked like something that uh, Penn was called binary calculus, uh, which is something similar to sp spinor calculus, but with some minus somewhere. And uh, and uh, and Lee said, but this is looked like spin network. So um, this was 94, something like that. And uh, Lee and I, Lee Smalling and I were working in Verona. So since we were confused, uh, uh, we decided to call uh, Roger Penrose. And uh, uh, Roger said, well, come here. And so Lee took uh, uh, an airplane from Verona to Oxford uh, to have um, Roger Penrose explained him how you do calculations with this binary calculus and spinor. We were, we were confused by a minus sign horrendously, whether we had to symmetrize or anti symmetrize these things. And uh, so Lee was in Oxford, I was in Verona, I called him. I said, So what did Roger say? Do we have to do the symmetric part or the anti symmetric part? And the answer was, Oh, Roger says that this is the same which you know, put us in total black. And in fact, it is the same, just a matter of definition of where you put the minus. So, it's this. so uh, why did, uh, what are uh, Roger Penrose's pin network and why he did that? Well, essentially, he was considering graph, trivalent graph, uh, 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 with spins attached to it, to, to each link. And uh, he was uh, saying that once you, this is a spin network. So a spin network is a graph, an abstract graph, trivalent, with spins attached to each, uh, uh, to, to each link. And every time you have a closed one, one without uh, um, external uh, legs, you can get a number out of it. You can put a number. And the number is defined as follow. Essentially, you put an intertwiner. I, I use the language, this language, not the language that Penn was using. You put an intertwiner here in each, uh, in each node. These are trivalent things, so you, get, you just get all this, um, um, these intertwiners, things with three indices, many of them. You contract them, this leg with this leg, this leg with this leg, this, this leg. So you have all this contraction and you get a number. This number is the evaluation of the spin network. Um, all right, so what? Um, if you have uh, some open legs uh, instead of a closed one, uh, you get two free indices, uh, two indices in the, in the representation of this final J1, J2 um, open links. Um, and you have two vectors, two vectors in two different representations. Imagine they are the same representation. Imagine they are in the, in the, in the, in, in the vector representation. They are really vectors. Okay. Uh, and uh, Roger noticed that they do behave like vectors and proved a certain number of theorems uh, saying that uh, with this structure you can sort of reconstruct uh, uh, I, I don't want to write the theorems and do all the, but from this structure you can basically reconstruct three-dimensional geometry. So you can get three-dimensional ge geometry uh, more and more precisely by going with larger and larger J and f bigger and bigger uh, spin networks uh, from uh, just this, um, this thing here in which you have only graph and half integers. Um, now why all that? Well. Uh, Penner explained this pretty clearly why he wanted to do that. In fact, in, in the text by Schrodinger, the 50s that I mentioned a couple of days ago, uh, uh, Penner wrote an introduction. It's very nice because Schrodinger says uh, um, uh, we were hoping to do quantum theory just as a continuous theory. Uh, I was hoping to do, Schrodinger says. Uh, uh, but there is discontinuity, is, uh, discreteness is, uh, is there, is unavoidable uh, because there is measurement. So if you only look at the Schrodinger equation, you miss half of quantum mechanics, right? Which is measurement, taking values. Uh, um, so discreteness is at, co at the core. And the idea that space is discrete in the small, it's an idea that has uh, inspired research in quantum gravity since the beginning. 
It's an old, uh, old idea. And it's very simple. I mean, you, you, you take a, a particle, you squeeze it very small, because as uncertainty principle is a lot of momentum, so it's a lot of energy. If there's a lot of energy, it has a lot of mass, so it makes a black hole around it, so it falls to the black hole. So there's no way to, to go smaller than something, and if you put the numbers, that's a Planck scale. So this idea is discrete as a Planck scale. So Roger Penrose in the 60s was saying, all right, so let's forget everything, and can I write a discrete version of three-dimensional space which has all the symmetries of three-dimensional space. And if you think it classically, it's obviously impossible, right? Because the moment you discretize, you break continuous symmetries. You cannot have something which is at the same time discrete. Symmetries are continuous. Where do you get continuity? But quantum mechanics is exactly what allows you to do that. Because that's what, if you want, representation theory of, of, of a rotation group goods. Uh, the group is continuous, but, uh, but LZ has eigenvalues. And LY also has eigenvalues. And L in that direction also has eigenvalues. So discrete in all directions, but in a funny way, in which when you rotate, um, the eigenvalue remains discrete, but you change continuously the probability of having one or the other one. Okay, so it's a funny way in which quantum mechanics, uh, it's not the quantum mechanics, it's a complete discrete theory. It's a theory about discrete things in which continuity comes out in, uh, in probabilities. So Roger says, wonderful, um, since this is clear, can I just do space like that? Recover three-dimensional Euclidean space from something discrete in the quantum mechanical sense. I know how to do for a single um, vector which is angular momentum. Angular momentum, but just one vector. Can I have the full space? So vectors here, vectors here, vectors here, vectors here. So I thought maybe I have a, I have a net of things. Uh, and that's how he so invented, pulled out of the blue this, uh, uh, this structure. Then <coughs> loop quantum gravity developed in a completely different manner, starting from general relativity. That's actual history. Doing the canonical analysis of general relativity, started with Dirac and then Bergman, and then Arnovit, Deser, Misner, it's a long way. And then there was this canonical form of general relativity. Um, Ashka rewrote the canonical general relativity in terms of new, 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 new variables, which was the Ashka connection and the E-field, which is exactly this E-field here. Um, the the E-field is actually a two-form. Um, and so you integrate on surfaces and you get these uh, things here. The connection is the connection where we're going to come back to that. And uh, at the beginning, uh, the, the one was thinking of uh, uh, functions of this continuous field in space-time. So everything was living on a manifold. And uh, uh, the states on which uh, loop quantum gravity was born, uh, starting from a technical result by Ted Jacobson and, uh, and, and Lee Smalling, that these were uh, sort of solving the Wilde Witt equation um, in some funny way, were states where a particular state, depending on a loop, which was the holonomy of the connection along the loop. So you had a loop in space, in, space, in three-dimensional space, embedded. And then, um, we had operator on that. Lee and I had some operator defined on the space of these things, which are the uh, grandfathers of the operator that I told you, of the operator L. Uh, we were called T operators, grasping operator at the time. And uh, um, we realized that one can do a sort of geometry of that, but uh, Holger Pulling is the one who said, uh, um, you always get zero volume in this way. And uh, uh, Jurek Lewandowski, is the one that realized that uh, this loop have to um, necessarily inter these states have to necessarily intersect, and so what really matters is the graph, not the loop. And uh, we're very confused about this graph. This is a graph embedded in space, but of course one of the key aspects of, of GR was diffeomorphism invariance. So this big Hilbert space you have to divide by the action of diffeomorphism. And very soon, that's the beginning of loop quantum gravity, we realize that dividing by the action of diffeomorphism means to consider the graph irrespectively of where it is in the manifold. 
So that gave the idea, of, forget the manifold, just keep the graph. Okay? And on this graph, there was this operator um, acting, and we had the operator for uh, area and volume from the, from the original operator defined, defined here. So we were very happy. We did the first volume again value calculation. We published it. It was wrong because Renata Law realized it was a mistake, a minus sign in our paper. Uh, but then we did it right. <laughs> and so finally, we had this operator. And we realized that the graph with the operator of the Hagen states we're behaving exactly like per spin, the Rogers spin networks. Why? Because that's basically the only way of doing discrete three-dimensional space uh, with the S SU2 or SO3 symmetry, more or less. So that's the that's story. So uh, I, I gave you a precise definition of what is the evaluation of spin network. Um, how is it related to the spin network states? Right? We have. Uh, we have a, a, a little bit more complicated structure. Let me put the, the graph here also to, to, to name the state. We have a graph with spin on the link, exactly like a spin network. Uh, but since the spin network can be more than trivalent, we have to say which intertwiner here. So we have this uh, intertwiner on the nodes. So this is a state. But this are uh, element of an Hilbert space, which, for instance, in the uh, basis of the uh, group elements, uh, we, we know exactly how to write down. This is a, a, a bunch of uh, uh, D, J, M, N um, uh, of H, L, 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 L. Uh, many of these contracted with all these intertwiners. So I can write this as a product over L, contracted with a product of the intertwiner. Um, and this, all the, this contraction here, all the indices here and all the indices here are determined by, uh, by the network. So each intertwiner has indices here, each link has indices here, and, and, and the network says how the, so let me put a gamma here. Good. So what is Penrose's evaluation of the spin network? It's just contracting these without this. So if you put the identity here, you get a number. The value of the state, this is a state on HL, okay? labeled by all these things, gamma, j. The value of the state on the identity is Penrose spin network evaluation. So what is called evaluation of a spin network is the quantum gravity state of the spin network uh, computed in the identity. That's a relation between uh, Penrose evaluation of spin network and the loop quantum gravity spin network states. So it's not the same thing. It's sort of they, 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 they talk to one another enormously. They sit one into the other. But Penrose. Uh, uh, in Penrose theory, you have just graph with labels and a number you can compute out of it. Here, you have uh, graph with labels, each one of which give a function on SU2 to the L. OK? It's clear the relation between these two things. Sometimes people are confused because, well, people come to me and say, well, you have this spinetto state, but it's just a number. How can it be a state? I mean, it depends on what. Something is missing. To go from trivalent to covalent, you just merge to. Ah, okay. So this is the next question. In fact, this this I, I'm I'm getting to the to to, to this. Um, since a no, actually, I can I can do it now. A, a four valent state, a four valent intertwiner can be thought as two three valent intertwiners, um, and. In, in some particular basis uh, with a spin in between. So you say, well, also, four valent intertwiners are the same. Four valent networks are the same as three valent networks. And that's something you, you often hear. Well, careful, because uh, if you have this spin network here with a k here, you have a link here. So you have a group element here. So the state is a function of a group element here. Okay? The state lives in a 
in a Hilbert space of functions of the group element here. Now, if you evaluate on the identity whether there was a function of HL or it's irrelevant, so the evaluation of the spin network um, with this link or the evaluation of the spin network with intertwiner with uh, uh, with intertwiner k is the same thing, but as a state they're not the same thing, because the the state with a four-valent intertwiner does not depend on a group element in between, while the state uh, uh, with two trivalent things does depend on the. And if you think physically, it's just let's put it naively: you have one point or two points. If you have one point, there is nothing to go from one to another. So the state does not depend on, on a group element. If you have two points, there is some degree of freedom of how you go from one to the other. So you have more variables around. Good. So that was the uh, first question. Second question is about G. First of all, let me give the formula, and then, uh, of course, I'm not sure I remember the formula. It's delta m minus n times minus 1 uh, to the j minus m. If it's not this one, it's almost check it on the book. And then let me tell you what it is, because this is, this is on Landau, actually. He, he computed it. Uh, it's, it's all over if you find it, but it's uh, very nice. <coughs> So what it is? Uh, we have this representation spaces AJ. This is a representation of spin J uh, theory. So the the vectors there have a have a, a uh, an index m. The usual sort of the quantum mechanic notation is this one, right? So the eigenstate of L Z. So the uh, object which have a total spin J and uh, angular momentum uh, uh, m. And then uh, if you fix J and value m, so if you if you take uh, uh, generic vector sum over m v m j m this is a linear space and this is this thing here now on this thing there are two uh, um, uh, quadratic operations that you can do there are two ways you can map this time cross itself into the complex numbers and the two should not be confused that's the key point um, which is, uh, I already said that for spin one half, but this is general. One is that uh, this is actually a Hilbert space. <coughs> uh, the matrices that transform this into one or the other are unitary with respect to, to a um, uh, Hilbert product, a scalar product. So there's a scalar product. So there is a map from this times itself into the complex number, which is a scalar product. Okay, and uh, how is this map? Well, this is a basis, and it is an orthonormal basis of this basis diagonalized self adjoint operator. So obviously, J M uh, J M prime is delta M M prime. Um, so that's a that's a scalar problem. V M, uh, if you have V W. Uh, this is Vn, Wn, delta Mn, that's just using that, but remember, the scalar product is antilinear, so the bar, which is relevant if you do three-dimensional real spaces, vectors, you, but if you do um, complex things, you have to remember the bar. So this is one um, uh, quadratic uh, structure on AJ, but there's another one. That's the point. And this other one should not be confused with uh, with that one. And what is the other one? Well, uh, just think about basics, angular momentum things. If you um, take the tensor product of something which itself, this is the sum of some H uh, uh, K, uh, K going from J minus J to J plus J, of k. And in particular, inside here, since it starts from j minus j, which is 0, there is a 0 thing. So this is h0 
plus other stuff. And this H0 is just complex number. It's a trivial representation. So that's mean they're given two vectors um, in the scalar product you can you, you, you can decompose its it, 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 it scalar product in components. There's one component which is invariant under SU2. Okay? And uh, you say, oh, it's a scalar product. No, it's not a scalar product. <laughs> because this is linear in both. It's not anti-linear. So there should be something else, which is the um, uh, 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 you take some V, you take some W, and out of these two, you construct a quantity, G M N, uh, which is linear, there's no bar here, such that um, this thing is uh, uh, VW, different notation than this one, um, is invariant under rotation. So there should be a, 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 a two-dimensional matrix with indices, uh, uh, it, it's a square matrix, uh, with indices in, 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 uh, uh, um, in this vector space here, which is invariant. And there always is. And it's, it's this one. Now, it's much easier to think about this in the... Uh, when I get confused, I always think about irreducible representation of SU2 as symmetrized tensor of fundamentals. Because now, if you think of a symmetrized tensor, um, you can write HJ, the element of HJ, you can write them as spinors with 2J indices. All symmetric. Right? Uh, this is just another basis uh, um, for, for, for this one. So this, th there should be a version of G uh, in the form A1, A2J, B1, B2J which is this in that basis, uh, and that's obvious, because that's epsilon A1, B1, epsilon A2J, B2J, because epsilon is the only invariant thing under as you do. And uh, uh, this is uh, completely sy anti is symmetric here, is symmetric here, so you symmetrize all the A indices, you symmetrize all the B indices, or if these are already symmetric, you just use this product here. So this is equal to this thing here. So this is obvious what it is. If you translate it, if you go from this basis to the other, which is not too hard, if you just sit down and you think about LZ, uh, you, you, know, you, you see how to write these in terms of this, uh, uh, this translated into, into that. That's not how Landau does it. The way Landau does it uh, is, is as a physicist. Uh, he says, well, if you have a, a state with Lz equal m, and you want to combine it with a state, another state, which is in the fundamental, in the fundamental, Lz has only eigenvalue 0. So the only possibility of putting of having, say, a particle with uh, angular momentum min minus j together with something that gives angular momentum z is to put together with something with the opposite angular momentum. So this duality things should not take m with m, but m. So this should not be equal, but should have opposite sign. That's what it says here. And then he does a little calculation and discovers that this is right up to a minus sign. <laughs> In fact, put the minus sign there. Landau way of doing things. Um, okay, so this is this object here. Okay, so we have this. So uh, by keeping this duality here, which is the SC two duality, is not the scalar product duality in mind. Um, one can also use this as we use vectors. So keep the keep the indices always up and lower with this. So to do invariant things by by uh, 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 by keeping indices up and down uh, correctly. Uh, <coughs> using that notation, the four valent intertwiner, remember that the three valent intertwiner, M1, M2, M3, which is also the notation J1, J2, J3, M1, M2, M3, is the same thing. 
this notation here when uh, this is the notation um, of the three J Wigner symbols. Uh, then the a basis of four valent intertwiners, M1, M2, M3, M4. So now it's not unique, but I can label this um, a basis of this with a, a, a spin K, where K is a range of all possible spins that have a, a consistent Klebsch-Gordon uh, condition with uh, all of this. And this is defined to be, let me now be precise, J1, J2, K, M1, M2, M, G, M, N, uh, K, J3, J4, um, N, uh, M3, M4. Okay? Well, that's, I think it's clean, which it's it's obvious, right? You have one trivalent, one trivalent, and here you have to dualize. You have to put them together in an invariant manner. So it's not a scalar product here. It's it's this G here. It's the invariant way of combining things, which is something I used to do wrong at the beginning. I put the scalar product there, and then things were not working, and I couldn't understand. Okay. Uh, now, answering question three is completely easy, because what is the relation between this object here and the klebsch gordon coefficient? They're exactly the same thing up to G. So these things are, um, if you put the indices up and down, um, you can think of this as uh, M1, M2, M3, and the klebsch gordon coefficients are um, M1, M2, M3, M. So the actual relation between the two is that J1, J2, J3, M1, M2, M3 is the klebsch gordon coefficient J2, M2, J3, M3, uh, J3, M, but this M and this M here are related by a G M3 M. So they are the Klebsch gordon coefficients up to a, a sign and a shift of uh, sign of the, of the M. So you can see that with uh, something contracted with the Klebsch gordon Exactly. Exactly. Klebsch gordon evaluated on... Uh, exactly. Exactly. Um, all these things are there are books in which all things are carefully written down. Typically, they're written for uh, atomic physics and nuclear physics, where they work with uh, SU2 representation theory. There's a big book written by three Russians, in which have all the 3J, 6J, NJ. And, uh, and in fact, uh, for some calculation loop quantum gravity, somebody has gone down and used them heavily. Um. OK, so that's three. Four and five, I'll just say a few words. Um, what fixes the little number here? Well, I anticipate that the little number here is going to be 8 pi, only because uh, uh, in front of the action is not 1 over g, but it's actually 1 over 16 pi g, which is 1 half, uh, the usual 1 half in front of the action, because you have two things when you take derivative. And then there's 8 pi g, so there's an 8 pi here. But it's not just 8 pi, there is another number which is called gamma, which is about there. We need the parameter, which will play a role uh, in the in the in in the in the following. And uh, how does one derive the value here by doing the canonical analysis precisely and by uh, requiring a la, a la, a la Dirac that uh, the commutator are defined to be uh, i h bar uh, Poisson bracket. So you compute the Poisson bracket between variables. You demand that the quantum operators um, uh, satisfy that. Now, wh why Dirac demands that? Because if this is true, 
then from the quantum theory, when you get the classical limit, you get the theory correct. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's a backward. Uh, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll sketch the uh, derivation, the canonical derivation. So the, 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 the symplectic structure, the Poisson bracket, I'll sketch it and I'll, 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 I'll tell you when we do the, the action next week, uh, how this gamma come in. So last thing, um, what is this H? Now I said roughly that it, it's a rotation when you go to the frame of one tetrahedra to the frame of the other tetrahedra. This is correct, but it's incomplete. To um, uh, see what exactly is uh, uh, the best is, again, uh, do the Hamiltonian an analysis uh, carefully and uh, um, uh, uh, find, find the right interpretation of this connection here. And what we will find is, is the, it, it is the, the holonomy, the exponentiation of the connection along a line. That's the way you have to, you can think about it. Um, but it's not a three-dimensional connection. It's not a spin connection. It's not the connection of the, of the, of the triad. Is the Ashik connection. And uh, it has to be so because uh, um, we have the operators L, E, and these operators here. They don't commute. So this is like position and momentum. So this has to be the, the time derivative of the other one. And the three-dimensional, as somebody was saying yesterday, uh, if I have the three geometry, then the connection is uniquely determined, up to gauges. So if this was a spin um, connection defined by the triad, it would be a function of this. And it would commute with this, but it it doesn't. I mean, this is a derivative operator takes a derivative of that, so it has to be, or it has to at least to contain a part uh, which is that's commuted, which is the momentum, which is the time derivative. And in fact, it is a time derivative. It will see this is a sort of the Ashika connection is a spin connection plus something which is essentially a time derivative of the metric, how the metric changes. So this will become clear. Uh, ahead, but just wanted to anticipate to, to avoid that you two sort of get fixed in some idea which is wrong. So, um, this is an holonomy of a three dimensional connection of an SU2 connection, but it's a, uh, not the one uniquely determined by the triad, the Ashaka connection, which knows about the time derivative of the triad, so the, the, the independent variable. So, these were the answer to the or questions or fix it some holes here and there. I hope this will clarifies a little bit more the, uh, this part. Do you have further questions? No? So let's keep this short, stop now, and start uh, um, five minutes before um, uh, 10, and we'll talk about time now. Just change and leave this on the side. <laughs>